Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, it depends. I am Mercé Wada, co-founder and medical director of ACE Alzheimer's Center Barcelona. I would like to welcome all of you to this third session of ACE Global Research Summit 2021, organized by ACE Alzheimer's Center. Today's session is going to focus on blood circulating factors contributing to dementia pathophysiology. It's a great opportunity to be here on a topic that really matters. How is the traffic of elements established between peripheral and central compartment and what propose? What is the role of the blood blood barrier? Can we answer these questions? We are a very privileged to have a highly rewarded panel of the speakers, including Tony Wiscray and Dr. Berislav Slokoswik. First of all, please allow me to say a few words about the domestics of this webinar. Each speaker is allotted a 25 minutes time slot. After two talks, we have 45 minutes for discussion and debate. You can send your questions through the chat. And if you want to speak, can you raise your hand? I also would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners with a special mention to Grifols for making this summit possible and for their continuous support. Lastly, I'm delighted to introduce you the chairman of this session, Dr. Matley. Also, he was introduced himself. I will make a brief presentation of Dr. Butler. He's a clinical senior lecturer in the Department of the Brain Science at Imperial College of London. And the principal investigation of the memory research group at the University of Oxford. His labs investigates the cognitive and neuroimaging characteristic of memory impairment in Alzheimer's disease and other neurological disorders. He's also a consultant in neurology at Imperial College of London and a visiting professor at the Universidad Católica de Chile and associate investigator at the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence in Cognition and its disorders. Hi, Chris, please go ahead and start the session whenever you are ready. Thank you very much, Dr. Boada. I'm delighted to be able to welcome everyone to the third and final Global Research Summit 2021, hosted by AFI Alzheimer's Center Barcelona, in collaboration with Grifols. My name is Chris Butler, and I'm a cognitive neurologist and clinical senior lecturer in the Department of Brain Sciences at Imperial College London. Our topic today is one of great and growing interest for dementia researchers and clinicians the role of circulating blood factors in contributing to dementia pathophysiology. Our two highly distinguished speakers will discuss the latest advances in our understanding of how blood-based molecules may in fact play a role in driving, aging and neurodegeneration, and how disruption to the blood-brain barrier facilitates the entry of these molecules into the brain. These findings are now motivating searches for novel forms of treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Our first speaker is Tony Wieskore, who is the D.H. Chen Distinguished Professor of Neurology and Neurological Sciences at Stanford University, the Associate Director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging, and the Director of the Stanford Alzheimer's Disease Research Center Biomarker Core. Dr. Wieskore's lab studies brain aging and neurodegeneration with a focus on age-related cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. His early landmark discoveries showed that circulatory blood factors can modulate brain structure and function, and factors from young organisms can rejuvenate old brains. Building on this work, he has more recently been focusing on how the immune system and the organism as a whole 
age and how they communicate with the brain. Dr. Wies Corey has authored many highly influential publications and has an impressive array of awards, including being voted second place breakthrough of the year by Science Magazine in 2014. I'm very excited to hear what he has to share with us today and would like to remind everyone please to post your questions in the chat so that we can go through them following the conclusion of the two presentations. So I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Wies Corey, who will talk to us about blood factors as regulators of brain aging and function. Thank you, Dr. Butler and Dr. Boada for inviting me to give a presentation here. Uh, I would like to discuss our findings on blood factors as regulators of brain aging and function. And these studies really evolved from our basic question, how the brain ages and how it becomes susceptible to cognitive dysfunction, neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease. And we believe this is a very important question because there's really a tsunami of Alzheimer's disease coming towards us. It's an age-related disease. We know that at, at age 85 or so, roughly a third of people have this devastating disease. And most patients with Alzheimer's disease are older than 75 years of age. And this is a global problem. As people get older across uh, the planet, more and more people become older and susceptible to these age-related diseases. And it is estimated by 2030, there will be 75 million people with Alzheimer's disease. But Alzheimer's disease is not the only age-related disease that affects people as they get older. This graph here shows on the x-axis, as people get older, there are more and more age-related diseases that affect them. And you can see here in these different colors, that at age 70 or 80, there's five or six different diseases that people often have. And they treat each one of these diseases with individual treatments. Um, but there has been um, a movement in the aging field to explore the idea whether rather than treating diseases, age-related diseases one at a time, whether one could in fact treat aging and slow down aging or reverse it in what people often call rejuvenation. So targeting age-related diseases by slowing down or even reversing the aging process. And this is of course not a new idea. Since people recorded history, they have been dreaming about living forever or staying young forever, such as shown here in this painting from Lucas Granach the Elder, where old and frail people enter this fountain of youth and they emerge young and rejuvenated on the other side. But we know, of course, this is not possible for human at the, humans at this time. But what's really exciting is that this might in fact be feasible in mice. There are now multiple interventions that show that across the organism of the mouse, tissues and functions can be reversed and slowed down um, and rejuvenated. And these include metabolic interventions such as caloric restriction, exercise, or the use of different small molecules, the removal of senescent cells, which are de detrimental inflammatory cells that trigger aging processes, and most recently, transient epigenetic reprogramming, where cells are reprogrammed to become younger again and again rejuvenate the host. But what I would like to discuss with you for the rest of the talk is this idea and, and finding that young blood may have rejuvenating properties. And this really started with an experiment that involved so-called parabiosis, where a young and an old animal are surgically connected such that they share the blood supply. So young blood can flow into the old mice and vice versa. And this was really used first by um, Thomas Randall here at Stanford University when he was studying muscle stem cell aging. So Tom asked the question whether muscle stem cells age and are unable to regenerate muscle tissue in old people or old mice because the cells themselves are getting old or there's something in the environment that is getting old and not able to regenerate the cells. And what he found is that indeed, 
there are factors from the old environment that are detrimental because when he joined an old mouse with a young mouse, the muscle regenerated and rejuvenated again, uh, almost growing like in a young mouse. And he also found similar effects in the liver and had some indication that this may also apply to the brain. And that's where a collaboration, a very fruitful collaboration with my lab started. And in the meantime, multiple other labs have shown that factors in young blood can regenerate and rejuvenate the old brain. This also applies to many other tissues, again, suggesting that there are factors in the young blood that can regenerate tissues. What we were also able to show, Saul Vileda, uh, who was a graduate student at the time in my lab, was able to show that you can simply infuse young plasma repeatedly into old mice and get similar effects. Now, how would this possibly work? Blood is, of course, the tissue that connects all the other organs in our body, and it, con it, it transports not only cells such as red blood cells and white blood cells, but it also carries thousands and thousands of different molecules from one tissue to another and basically functions as the connecting highway in an, 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 an organism. So we can then simply ask, how does the blood actually age? How does it change with aging? And when we look at that here in a large study of over 4,000 healthy people, and we measured 3,000 different proteins in the blood, you can show, you can see here, these 4,000 peoples on the x-axis, and then the 3,000 proteins we measured, blue shows low levels of a factor, and yellow shows high levels of a factor. And what you can see, is that there are dramatic changes as people get older. Many factors are low, at low levels when you're young, but they increase as you get older and other factors show other types of changes. <clears throat> well, we can also ask now, how do these factors change at each given age? So if we look, for example, at age 40, how many proteins are different in 40 year old people compared to the younger than 40 compared to those older than 40. And if we add up all these proteins that change at each given age, what we see are these waves of aging. Particularly intriguing is this early change um, where you have an inflection point around age 35 where more than 400 proteins are significantly different in people younger than 35 compared to those older in 35, suggesting that they're First of all, constant changes in the, the levels of these factors and thus in the communication between cells and tissues in the body. But specifically, there are very early changes that happen um, as we get older. There's another wave at around 60 and then the most prominent one at age 80. So we can start to ask what are the changes that occur here and how do they potentially contribute to the aging process? So it becomes then less surprising that if you change the blood from a young to an old organism that you will have prominent effects. And so again, what we found is if you transfer young plasma into an old mouse, you get increased stem cell activity, you get increased plasticity, less inflammation, and most importantly, you can improve the memory of these mice. And vice versa, if you give old plasma to a young mouse, you get the opposite effects. You can reduce neurogenesis, reduce plasticity in the brain, impair memory function and cause inflammation, suggesting that there are old factors that are bad for the brain and young factors that are good for the brain. And some of these have been identified, um, factors that have effects on the brain or on other tissues are listed here, positive factors, but there's also negative factors that we have been able to identify in this field. So this leads to the notion then that biological age of a cell or an entire organism is not set in stone, but it's actually malleable. It's plastic. It can be slowed down. It can be reversed. It can be accelerated. And that really makes aging a druggable target. And as a consequence, there are now dozens and dozens of companies that are focusing on targeting aging processes to treat age-related diseases. And here is just um, a list of many of these companies. 
But the big question is, of course, can this be translated to humans? So can humans benefit from this young plasma? And to test this concept, we have started a company, Alcahes, which uh, together initially with uh, the Department of Neurology here at Stanford with Sharon Shaw, did a small study where we infused plasma from young donors to patients with Alzheimer's disease in a safety study. And then in the follow-up study that Alka has conducted um, uh, directly with a, with a contract organization, they infused repeatedly a fraction of plasma from young donors to uh, again into Alzheimer's patients to test whether this may have beneficial effects. These were proof of concept studies. They're not powered enough to have a clear result. They were also not double blinded and placebo controlled, but what they suggest, first of all, it's safe. And there's indications uh, based on historical uh, samples that this is uh, potentially beneficial. But a more powerful study has actually been done uh, by our host, Merce Boada, together with uh, Dr. Lopez and Antonio Paez, where they did the opposite. So they removed old plasma from patients with Alzheimer's disease. And this was actually a high powered uh, a clinical trial that was uh, placebo controlled, double blind in 500 patients with Alzheimer's disease. And what they did is they removed the old plasma and then they replaced it with an albumin fraction that is rich in many other proteins, including albumin, and that is from young donors around 35 of years of age. And the most important outcome of this is that it really uh, showed benefits on progression of the disease, on memory function, and on daily functioning in patients with moderate Alzheimer's disease. So this starts to really confirm this concept that we see in mice that plasma, removing plasma or giving um, young plasma um, has beneficial effects. Um, and suggests that this could be applied to humans. But one uh, very important question that remains is how would this young plasma that is given into the blood, how would this potentially get to the brain? There is this blood-brain barrier. And so how would uh, we potentially uh, start to understand how these factors from the blood can actually communicate with the brain? And you can imagine three sort of principal possibilities. One is that the blood-brain barrier is not closed in some areas and that factors can directly access the brain. It's possible that factors are transported into the brain. A prominent example would be transferrin, which binds to a receptor that then shuttles the protein into the brain where it can interact with other brain cells. And maybe a third possibility is that a factor regulates directly the activity of the vasculature of the endothelial cells in the blood vessels, and in this way um, influences the communication with brain cells. To test this question, a, a graduate student, Andrew Yang in the lab, decided to label the entire plasma proteome. So he took plasma from young animals, he labeled them chemically with different tags, either classic radio labels with fluorescent tags of different size and different um, charges, and then also with biotin. And he injected this into mice intravenously, four hours later extensively washed the vasculature, perfused the mice, then took out the brain and imaged it with different technologies, either radio tracer, but also next generation sequencing, and uh, immune, uh, immune uh, sorting and histology. And if you look at one of these brains that was acutely, from a mouse that was acutely injected with a fluorescent labeled plasma proteome, uh, you can see that there is significant uptake of plasma proteins in the brain. Most of it ends up in this big area here, this uh, light green area, which, which are the ventricles of the mouse brain, but you can also see um, staining throughout the brain. And if we use more classical histological techniques, you can see here in this image, this is a coronal section of the mouse brain that essentially the whole vascular tree lights up. Again, uptake of plasma shown in white, 
also into the ventricular space. And if you zoom in, you can actually see that the vasculature is really decorated with these small vesicles that are filled with plasma. So significant uptake of plasma proteins into the endothelium and actually beyond. What we can see in uh, histological sections is that in some areas, neurons actively take up plasma proteins, again shown here in white, in neurons in the hippocampus or in the neocortex. You see these large neurons that are filled with plasma proteins that come from the circulation that we labeled and injected. Um, and then off, uh, uh, occasionally you also see microglia. There's, there's between one to 10% of microglia dependent on the brain region that can take up labeled plasma proteins, um, suggesting again that there is a communication between the periphery, between the circulation and some of these uh, cells in the immune system. If you look, use classic um, radio tracer labeling, and here we uh, specifically label um, an Ig antibody um, with a radio tag uh, in a classic experiment that many other groups have shown, including um, my uh, co-speaker here, uh, Betsa Slokovic, um, that with age, there is a leakiness of the blood-brain barrier. There's increased uptake of proteins such as immunoglobulins. And you can see here, there's a significant increase in the uptake of immunoglobulins into the age brain. So we hypothesize that similarly, there would be more plasma proteins be taken up beyond uh, antibodies. But what we saw was the exact opposite. So here, uh, labeling again plasma proteins with a radio tag, the whole plasma proteome, we see lots of uptake in young animals, but much less, about 40% reduction in aged animals, suggesting that this must be a different process from the well-known sort of leakiness that you see with age. And indeed, when we look at possible transport mechanism, there is a specific transport I mentioned that transferrin uses that uses clathrin-coated uh, vesicles. And you see many of these vesicles in young vasculature, in young mice, but much fewer in old mice. And there's again about a 50% reduction here. But on the other hand, you see an increase in non-specific uptake that uses caviolin-labeled vesicles. And here you see very few in young, but much more in old. And there's a four to five-fold increase. So that shows to us there's a shift from specific to non-specific uptake of proteins into the brain. We want to understand what are these proteins, what are they doing in the brain, how are they potentially regulating brain activity. So in conclusion, what we find is that factors in young blood can slow or reverse aspects of aging, including in the brain. Many plasma proteins can enter the young brain and are taken up by neurons and other brain cells. And with age, this transport of plasma protein shifts from a specific receptor-mediated transport to a non-specific with overall less protein uptake. And these findings can possibly be translated to humans and can lead to the identification of active blood factors that can potentially lead then to new therapies. And with this, I would like to thank uh, a terrific uh, team in my lab, many collaborators, some of them listed here, and then funding from these agencies and uh, foundations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Wieskore, for this fascinating talk. Now, our second speaker is Dr. Berislav Slokovic, the director of the Zilkar Neurogenetic Institute and professor and chair of the Department of Physiology and Neuroscience at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. He's also professor of biological sciences at the Dawn Seif College of Letters, Arts and Sciences, also at USC. Dr. Slokovic studies the role of brain microcirculation, particularly the blood-brain barrier in health and disease in the adult brain and during brain aging. 
His work has shown that dysfunction in the blood-brain barrier and brain microcirculation is an early biomarker of cognitive dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease and can occur prior to neuronal loss, opening up new targets for therapeutic intervention. His team has also developed new imaging methods for studying blood-brain barrier function in the living brain, findings which are being applied in late phase clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease patients. Dr. Slokovic is recognized internationally as a leader in the fields of Alzheimer's disease and stroke research. Indeed, Thomson Reuters and Clarivate Analytics listed him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds for 18 consecutive years. And he has received numerous awards in recognition of his contribution to the field of neurological sciences. Dr. Slokovic, many thanks for participating in our Global Research Summit. We very much look forward to hearing about your work. Good afternoon. I would like to thank Fundacio AC and Griffos for kind invitation and Dr. Boada and Chris Butler. I'm honored to present at the first Global Research Summit in Barcelona. Sorry, this is not an in-person visit because Barcelona is one of my favorite cities, but I hope next time when pandemic is over. I'll be talking about the blood-brain barrier link to neurodegeneration and implications for cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Just to remind everybody that brain vasculatures, that brain is highly vascularized organ with about 400 miles of vessels, most of this being at the level of brain capillary. Brain takes about 20% of heart output and 20% of oxygen and glucose consumption, but is only 2% of the body mass. There is this function in blood-brain barrier that is developed in human mammals and higher species. It prevents entry into the brain of blood-derived uh, cells, toxic products, and different pathogens, viruses, bacteria, and fungi. It's represented by endothelial layer that is tightly junctioned as shown here. And pericytes are cells that are blood-brain barrier associated and maintain blood-brain barrier integrity. So blood-brain barrier breakdown and dysfunction uh, was found in several neurological diseases, including Alzheimer's. And small vessel disease of the brain is present in 50% of all dementias. Now there are many pathways as shown here how blood-brain barrier breakdown can lead to neurodegeneration. One is, for example, red blood cells, uh, extravasation, accumulation of toxic iron species and reactive oxidant stress. Another one is fibrinogen that activates inflammatory response and microglia and also kills oligodendrocytes. Thrombin is directly toxic to neurons. Albumin activates um, astrocytes uh, through the GDA beta pathway and loss of pericytes uh, leads to loss of neurotrophic support, as we have recently shown. But more than just being a barrier, like a membrane, blood-brain barrier is a metabolic organ within the organ. So it's a metabolic organ of the brain and acts as an ecosystem, like what the ozone layer is for the earth. So there are more than 10,000 transcripts for different transporters, receptor ion channels, tie junction traffic factors, and more than about 5,000 proteins. So the blood-brain barrier maintains chemical composition necessary for normal brain and neuronal functioning and provides almost everything that brain needs for its metabolism. One example is, for example, sugar transporter GLUT1 that is present in 30 million copies and brain does not have energy metabolite reservoir. So it has to get all of his sugar and energy metabolites from blood. So what happens if there is uh, a loss of endothelial blood-brain barrier GLUT1 transporter is very specific for brain endothelium. So inherited loss leads not only to diminished glucose transport, followed by blood-brain barrier breakdown, but after a period of time, like about six months, uh, in this mouse model of haploinsufficiency, there is uh, obvious neuronal dysfunction as shown by imaging evocortical membrane potential responses over here. There is distorted activation of cortical responses, and is followed also by loss of neurons as shown here in the hippocampal CA1 region there is about 10 to 15% loss and is associated with about 4% uh, microcephaly, reduction in brain size. So this is very similar to what is found in pediatric disease, GLUT1 deficiency syndrome, and has implications uh, for uh, developmental delay and microcephaly. Now, another transporter of the blood-brain barrier that is specifically expressed in endothelial cells called MSFD2A, transport the essential omega-3 fatty acids from blood into the brain. 
So loss of these transporters uh, or loss of its activity as it happens in missense mutations in humans leads to loss of blood brain barrier integrity, as you can see here, leakages into the brain that eventually lead to neurodegeneration and microcephaly. So human rare monogenic neurologic diseases, there is about 20 of these, are best example showing causal pathogenic link between blood brain barrier dysfunction and neurological disease and neuronal dysfunction. These genetic defects are present at the blood brain barrier or a blood brain barrier associated vascular cells. For example, disruption of PDGFB and PGFR beta system in pericytes leads to fire disease, idiopathic basal ganglia calcification. As I mentioned, GLUT1 deficiency syndrome leads to microcephaly, seizures, developmental delay. Mises mutation in MSFD2A also lead to microcephaly, intellectual and speech disability, and could be also fatal. MC2A, Talenhendron Dudley syndrome leads to psychomotor retardation, et cetera, et cetera. Also loss of collagens, membrane proteins leads to hemorrhagic stroke and so forth. So what is very interesting here when we talk about uh, human uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other, the blood-brain barrier breakdown has been documented by neuropathological studies in these diseases as shown here, for example, toxic fibrinogen uh, um, accumulates around the blood vessels and they usually actually accumulate together with amyloid beta and there is also some other stuff coming from brain. Now, the important thing is when these things are happening and when the change is happening, which we of course cannot say from neuropathological studies. Therefore, we developed a few years ago, novel technique, DC, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging technique in which gadolinium bolus is injected into the brain circulation, um, actually intravenously and is followed through carotid and brain circulation and can actually show if the blood brain barrier is intact or is not or is permeable. And so first what we show there is aging effects. So during normal aging, the blood brain barrier gives up in certain regions, particularly in the hippocampus and some regions of medial temporal lobe. And this is potentiated in individuals with my cognitive impairment. Now, the first question we ask is that downstream to amyloid beta and tau because they are both vascular toxic. And the answer was no. So we found that whether people are amyloid beta positive, a beta 42 by CSF negative or positive, it really doesn't matter. Or also in an impaired stage, there will be an opening of the blood brain barrier in hippocampus and perhaps ample gyrus that really correlates with mild cognitive impairment and, and show here with CDR scores. And similar was true for tau and p tau, phosphorylated p tau 181 over here. So we then wanted to make sure that, that this also stands uh, when we neuropsychologically tested these individuals. And so we had a 10 test testing uh, four cognitive domains, memory, attention, executive function, language, and global cognition. So we saw again that with one domain impaired, it doesn't really matter whether the person is negative for a beta or positive in CSF. In other words, whether it's on Alzheimer's pathway, if it is positive or negative, when it's not, there is a breakdown of the blood brain barrier. And so the same thing was uh, shown for tau and was independent of tau positivity in the CSF. Since APOE4 is a major uh, genetic risk for Alzheimer's and uh, one allele increases by three to four fold and two allele by 14 to 50 fold, and APOE4 is present in 25% of the population, our next studies focus to see what is the effect of APOE4 gene on blood brain barrier. As you can see over here, uh, we see that in cognitively unimpaired people, APOE4 already developed considerable blood brain barrier breakdown in contrast to APOE3 folks that develop only with much, much milder uh, blood brain barrier breakdown at the MCI stage. And APOE4 progresses more with cognitive impairment. So there is a more progressive breakdown. And this doesn't depend again of amyloid beta positivity or negativity or tau positivity or negativity. This has been also confirmed by our studies uh, comparing amyloid PET, tau PET, and blood-brain barrier permeability by using uh, ROI analysis. So as you can see here, uh, there is a, a mild accumulation of amyloid PET both in APOE3 and APOE4 carriers that in this stage, a very early stage, uh, cognitively unimpaired, we did not find differences, neither differences in PET tau. 
uh, in the hippocampus, but there was an increase in blood-brain barrier permeability or breakdown, as we show in a larger group. So this shows this is completely not related to amyloid beta or tau accumulation. And the other way around, when we look in orbital frontal cortex, which is the position side for amyloid, preferably in ApoE4 carriers, and we show there is more uh, a beta deposition in them, there was no difference in blood-brain barrier permeability, which suggests that these are two independent pathways that may lead to cognitive impairment. Very interestingly, in cognitively unimpaired stage, if you look at the hippocampus volume and bilateral volume, we don't see any changes. So that means at a stage when we saw blood-brain barrier breakdown in E4 carriers. So that means that blood-brain barrier breakdown precedes, you know, uh, neurodegenerative changes. And then in later stage, as shown before, there is a drop in the volumes in the hippocampus, but this is happening after blood-brain barrier breakdown. We then look at the blood flow changes. This is a study that is currently in the progress. And we show also there is no changes in different regions in a blood flow at the cognitively unimpaired stage. When we see changes in the blood brain barrier, again, showing that these changes precede blood flow changes. Then later with the, with the two following points in a gray matter overall, we see that E4 carrier develop drop in the blood flow, but after blood brain barrier breakdown. So we also had a battery the, about 36 tests in the CSF or plasma that look at pericytes, biochemical markers of blood-brain barrier breakdown at tight junctions, endothelial, angiogenesis, neuroinflammation, amyloid beta peptide, and markers of neuronal injury. So in all these studies, really uh, SPDGFR beta, a novel marker of pericytic injury, stand out. So SPDGFR beta is a marker of pericytic injury and is an early biomarker of human cognitive dis uh, dysfunction. As we reported in Nature Medicine 2019, it is clear by Adam 10 uh, from PDGFR beta and released into the CSF when pericytes are affected by challenges such as hypoxia or maybe also amyloid beta peptide. So we wanted to see if high SPGFR beta values in the CSF are predictive of cognitive decline and how and is it related this to the APOE genetic uh, risk. So we split about 350 participants, about median values, about 600 nanogram per ml or below. And then we look in APOE4 carrier and APOE3 carriers, what is the predictive value? Those people who have high levels of SPDGFR beta over a period of time of 2.5 to 4.5 years follow-up has a dramatic dropout in mental status as uh, determined by MOCA or MMSCs or in global composite on 10 different cognitive tests. So they are really uh, dropping down highly. While APOE3 carriers do not follow that, there is a really some trend, but not really uh, significant. So we went then go back to the mechanism to our animal models in a paper we published in Nature a few years ago. And uh, this is humanized mice. They show blood-brain barrier breakdown in E4 mice, but not in E3 mice, that is control. And there is neuronal accumulation of toxic product very early, two weeks uh, to one month uh, in, this, in these animals. And what was interesting, then transgenic mouse that actually carries up E4, that is positive for cyclophilin A uh, gene, PPI, uh, does develop accumulation of these uh, blood products, in this case, IgG and thrombin also and fibrin in neurons. But when we genetically eliminate uh, cyclophilin A, or when we block it with cyclosporin, we don't see this effect. And then neuronal dysfunction follows after this in about four months. So it's a basically the same thing. So in Nature paper 2020, we confirm our results <coughs> in humans, what we showed before in mice. So using transgenic E4, E3 mice, and mice with genetic and pharmacological inhibition of cyclophilin AMMP9 pathway. And in human studies, studying activation of CPMMP9 in CSF in E4 carriers, in iPSC derived E4 pericytes, whereas E3 pericytes, we showed the role of pro inflammatory cyclophilin A MMP9 system that degrades the blood brain barrier and looks like both in animal models are in humans, suggesting that cyclophilin A is an important target. Then in a recent study that we just published yesterday in Nature Aging 2021, 
we showed that blockade of this pathway with a cyclophilin A inhibitor, Debio 25, that has been used for hepatitis C and some other indications, actually leads to um, elimination of and blocks cyclophilin A in um, E4 mice that is crossed with Alzheimer's mice and also MMP9, which results in partial recovery of neurodegeneration to the level of APOE3 mice that is crossed with FAD mice. And also this results in improvement in behavior as shown here by novel object recognition and novel object location. There were no changes in amyloid beta levels as illustrated here for A beta 42 and of course with much more data. So suggesting that acting on a blood brain barrier pathways, one can somehow slow down, not completely reverse, but slow down your degenerative process. Of course, this is complex model. So our single nuclear analysis of the vascular cells and pathways as shown over here, let me just go back. There is activation of several other pathways. So the cyclophilin A is not the beginning or end of the story because there is much more complex pathways that are affected such as VGFA, VGFR2 signaling, PI3K, AKTM, TOR signaling, chemokine, focal adhesion and calcium regulation. So these pathways are all affected in vascular endothelium. And this was confirmed basically by protomic analysis so the same pathway, VGF signaling, PI3K, AKT pathway, cytoskeleton, cell adhesion, and angiogenesis. So these are our unpublished data. And what is interesting, this happens before synaptic dysfunction, as shown here by PSD95, postsynaptic uh, interactome determination, when it shows different proteins and PPI network that were uh, damaged, like Shang 3 SYNGAP1, NFF, NMDR receptors, and et cetera. And these changes were very prominent at seven months, but not so much at two months, which also suggests that vascular changes proceed. Now I'm gonna go back to an early work that we've done over the past 15, 20 years, showing the role of blood-brain barrier in controlling amyloid beta peptide levels in the brain. So this is the major clearance receptor, LRP1, lipoprotein receptor with Krelay beta into the blood. And there is another receptor, RAGE, which actually brings A beta into the brain. So it's a re-entry of a beta from periphery, either alone or by a monocyte. So there is new RAGE inhibitor that was used in phase two, three studies that I'm gonna talk a little bit about by VTA Therapeutics that we developed and 70 papers use this RAGE inhibitor for different uh, indications from cancer, hypertension, diabetes, and et cetera. And there is also 40 follow-up confirmation papers showing that LRP1 plays a role in amyloid beta clearance. But besides the TLRP1, that is a major A beta tau and alpha nuclein clearance receptor, a recent work just published earlier this year shows that um, endothelial LRP1 is also responsible for maintaining the blood brain barrier phenotype. That was very interesting because a specific knockdown on LRP1 leads to blood brain barrier breakdown. And then, as shown here also by multiphoton imaging, and then leads to actually loss of neurons at a later point at four months of age, as shown over here. And so that's actually that um, deletion of this receptor from endothelium leads to neurogenitive process. What was interesting here, we were able to apply um, gene therapy with a, um, a smaller mini gene of LRP1 that has transmembranes at the plasmic domain and a binding for domain. And actually when we specifically deliver this MLRP1 gene, uh, via AAV2BR1 vector to brain vessels, we're able to show that this rescues both vascular phenotype, specifically when this LRP1 gene is expressed because it's expressed in about 45 to 50% of the vessels. But this was still um, good enough to slow down neurodegeneration process as shown here by recovery of neurons within actually month of treatment with this uh, mini LRP1 gene and by recovery of also behavior. And just uh, going to some of the conclusion here, uh, you know, we know that amyloid beta therapy is a very important therapy as shown here. We have some, some uh, other Kunamab, uh, you know, uh, stories that I think everybody is familiar. Our approach was in blocking rage and that was based on rage biology that we discovered in Nature Medicine paper published 2003. So blockade of amyloid beta with the rage at the blood brain barrier eliminates a brain uptake of amyloid beta, reduces inflammation, improves vessel integrity, and improves blood flow. So this approach 
is now in phase two, three in mild Alzheimer's patients with impaired glucose tolerance. And finally, I want to talk about uh, trigger three APC, which is mutant recombinant protein of activated protein C. We reduce anticoagulant activity that we actually produced, and also the ZZ Biotech, the company that I funded, uh, has been developed. So uh, that was shown in phase one study. Phase two study was shown that it's safe and target engagement. And now we got phase three study in 1,400 stoke patients approved for funding. So what was interesting from uh, about this molecule that is vascular protective for endothelium and stabilizes BB integrity, direct is neuronal protective and anti-inflammatory and has reduced anticoagulant activity by more than 90%. So in the phase two studies, it was shown that it's a very safe DLT rate was around 7% and interestingly reduced uh, blood bleeding after TPN thrombectomy uh, almost significantly, uh, but reduced significantly the incidence of bleeding by about 25%. And that was what we similarly show in animal RET model before the clinical phase two study started. In addition to stroke, it's also useful for Alzheimer's disease, CNS regeneration, traumatic brain injury, and ALS. And here I'm just going to show uh, recent work that we published in Alzheimer's models that besides neuronal protective, vascular protective effects, APC also blocks base one through NF kappa B and reduces amyloid beta production. So in addition to direct neuronal and vascular protective effects, there is reduction of amyloid beta production, which we think is a very useful feature. So the key points to take home message here, what I reviewed was that BBB is an ecosystem, metabolic organ of the brain, critical for normal brain metabolism and functioning. Genetic defects in transporters and, and the BBB leads to CNS dysfunction and also in some other genes. BB breakdown is an early biomarker of human cognitive dysfunction predicts cognitive decline in E4 carrier, precedes synaptic dysfunction in humanized E4 mice, and pharmacologic and gene therapy approaches towards the blood-brain barrier can slow down the neurogenerative process. So bench to bedside work that came from our studies was the blocking rage uh, that is in phase two, three studies that leads to sealing of BBB, improves flow and prevents a beta accumulation and blocks neuroinflammation. And with 3K3 APC, now it's a phase three pivotal trial for ischemic stroke, and there is proof of concept trial, phase two trial in ALS and has potential for AD. Finally, I want to thank the research uh, NIH, National Institute of Aging, and NINDS, Neurological Disorder and Stroke, Alzheimer's Association, Cure for Alzheimer's Fund, Leduc Foundation, and Open Philanthropy. And also the most talented researchers in my group that were shown here, who actually carried out this work. USC ADRC, Wash U ADRC, Banner Mayo Clinic, Huntington Institute, and Coba Lab at the Zilke. Thank you very much for attention, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, to Dr. Zlokovic. Uh, for that fascinating talk and indeed to to both of our speakers for such comprehensive uh, outlines and interdigitating um, discussions of uh, subjects related to the way that um, <coughs> circulating blood factors uh, may be driving uh, changes due to um, related to aging both more generally in the body and in the brain and the way that the blood brain barrier and its dysfunction uh, is uh, critically important for uh, the pathological changes which we see in Alzheimer's disease. So um, really wonderful um, talks that I know are generating lots of questions already. Um, I've got them all lined up in my chat here, but um, and I have lots myself, but I'm going to uh, offer the first of these questions to uh, Dr. Aboada, who I can see is, is waiting um, uh, desperately to ask someone something. Please okay. go. Okay, thank you, Alberto, you can. Open the micro, please. It's okay? Okay. Well, it was astonishing talks because we are learning a lot and we are reminding the blood brain barrier when you are uh, studying. My first question is for um, Benza, eh? that it's perfect to use this okay. local name. Thank you very much. Yes. As you can show and state the blood-brain barrier 
works as a metabolic organ, a beautiful one, connecting to the traffic from peripheral and central sang with a thousand and thousand of functions. Really, it's a plexus. And you have proposed that the, the BBB is an independent pathway, even from beta and for time, and tau for damage, for the brain damage and neurodegeneration. Following your experimental studies and you thought, what do you propose that the best biomarker currently available, if it's possible, and it's available for tracking the BBB dysfunction or breakdown? Well, no. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this very important question. I think based on, on some of our published data and also on the data by public that follow papers by several other groups, you know, there are six, seven right now. I would say that um, imaging the blood brain barrier breakdown is possible. And there is a test that is probably 15 minutes. Uh, you have to inject this a tracer, uh, the gadolinium, which is, which is done normally in other diseases such as multiple sclerosis, brain tumor, stroke to show blood brain barrier breakdown. And we have developed an advanced method in which we follow also what it is in the circulation in the carotid artery uh, mm -hmm. in these patients. So we can actually map the brain and see which parts of the brain are leaky uh, and becoming leaky and which are intact. And what we see is that with normal aging, uh, some parts become leaky and specifically area of hippocampus and medial temporal lobe sometimes called it nucleus and you can see these areas actually leaking the tracer and which means also they would probably allow uh, leakage of several toxic possibly toxic proteins you know as tony showed in in blood of these old uh, people older people there are more toxic proteins you know so it's um, it's really double whammy then you have this bad proteins coming into the brain into the areas that are involved with memory the other, the other uh, marker is probably another one that we are more validating right now, which is um, a soluble uh, platelet-derived growth factor beta receptor. It's present in pericytes and other mural cells, but it's specifically cleaved from pericytes uh, by an enzymatic process that involve ADAM10 and ADAM17 in uh, states when pericytes are um, uh, actually challenged by some type of uh, uh, injuries. You know, and it could be different injuries. It could be um, hypoxic injury. It could be also accumulation of some toxic proteins in pericytes because pericytes clear a lot of bad things and junk from our body. But then if they're overwhelmed, they just um, suicide, do the suicide. I mean, they can't, they can't really uh, go back. And so then they release this uh, molecule that we can measure in CSF. And some groups, also a group in Sweden, was validating this data in the plasma and also showed that uh, that we can uh, follow this marker in plasma, which would be, of course, much more. So I think there are hopes, and these are right now the most concrete ones, but also there will be some other ones that we can probably try to measure both in plasma and the CSF, like tie junction proteins or maybe uh, of the blood-brain barrier, or maybe some other, you know, also classical biomarkers are like albumin the ratio in the CSF and blood, yeah. fibrinogen and other products plasminogen that can be found in the CSF. So I think, uh, I mean, these are these are possibilities right now as we can see. Well, that is encouraging because we have to approach one is using the radio tracers, another is to promote the CSF biomarkers, including plasma that is, is a innovative and more easy to 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 work in the clinical in the clinical um, practice okay yeah. thank you very much and uh, I, I have time for another question for tony Wiscotti. please you are uh, please, please go please go ahead Dr. Maybe, oh i take some advantage to be the horse i'm sorry tony Tony, okay. During your talk, you are talking about something to remove, something to add, like plasma, that plasma fairy from young plasma in humans, because that, that, that when I read your first paper about the 
parabiosis it was astonishing because everybody thinking if this model can do to, to transport, to move to the humans. And the other, as you know, as you thank you because you are mentioned, is the plasma pheresis. And plasma pheresis to remove and to add. What do you think that at that moment you can add for rejuvenated or for to maintain and keeping the brain in the good shape? And what is the most important mass you can to remove? for the brain to the peripheral and uh, and use like a vest, like a vest. Well, yeah, that's a great not, question. Eh? It's not easy. I'm sorry. Eh? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I can only speculate, of course, but based on, um, you know, studies first in, in the muscle by by Tom Randall, my, my colleague here, uh, who showed that you can regenerate old muscle stem cells with with factors in in young blood um, and then many other studies that show that this can be similar be beneficial effects can be achieved in in many organs and we you know of course focused on the brain uh, suggests that you know the brain is quite plastic still at least in during normal aging of course we have we have done some studies with models of, of Alzheimer's disease, APP transgenic mice, and there we can also show um, cognitive improvements. Mm -hmm. But I think there is there seems to be a lot of plasticity. Um, at the same time, as you pointed out, there is this accumulation of detrimental factors with age. And um, I think the best approach is basically what you did is to remove old factors and then give uh, fresh young factors, as you know, uh, the albumin fraction that that you um, infuse back into patients contains lots of different proteins, not just albumin. It contains probably well over a thousand different proteins. Many of them are growth factors and may be beneficial. And so um, by removing old factors at, through plasmapheresis and then giving young factors, um, you have this um, effect that seems to produce clinically detectable benefits. So I'm, I'm very excited about this because I never thought that the studies from the mice would actually translate to humans. In the humans, very good. That is fascinating because it seems to be a very, very complex experiment. But to translate this one to the humans, that is a challenge. It's a challenge from the the next years, not for a decade. I want to be to get results, not in a decade, in the next few years. Thank yes. you, please. Thank you for uh, for your uh, for your answers, my question, and please for offer me this opportunity. Go ahead for the others. Okay. Thank you very much. So I've got a question here from uh, one of our. Um, one of our listeners who uh, asks Dr. Zlokovic, uh, there are some research groups and small startups developing in vitro models, for example, using cells derived from iPSCs, uh, trying to reconstitute the blood brain barrier for research. What's your opinion on the value of these artificial models? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I think uh, I can say that, uh, in my opinion, they're still in a validation process. So, really depends what you really want to study. I mean, you can study some molecular events, uh, of course, there, uh, but I think adding uh, more cell types to this model makes it kind of more complex. So I think from a holistic point of view, it's very nice if there is there are correlative studies using in vitro human blood brain barrier models or brain on chip models that could be correlated with findings, with clinical findings. So for instance, uh, what we have following APOE4 patients and APOE3, you know, and so we know their status of the blood-brain barrier, you know, um, and, in certain regions. So is it something that we can reproduce and study in vitro? So in my lab, we are trying to validate this, and it's a very complex uh, situation, so I don't think we, we have an answer. But certainly comparing with the, with the animal models also is helpful. So. I just uh, I just a little bit cautious about over interpreting findings from from uh, in vitro models, you know, because 
uh, it's very difficult to uh, reconstitute the complex organs such as a blood brain barrier with all components. But definitely uh, we can tackle some mechanistic questions such as like clearance of amyloid beta. Uh, we've done that such as, for example, clearance of tau and is there permeability? And then if you put neurons on the other side, you can infuse plasma from, let's say, from microbiome experiment or from like what Tony does and see what it does on these neurons. So I think it's actually uh, possible to get an, and, and get some some data, but we have to be careful when interpreting because it's not a live situation. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, something to watch very much for the future. So for Dr. Wies Corey, um, Mark Suarez in the audience asks, well, says great talk. Thank you very much. Do you think we will be able to uh, treat age related disorders like Alzheimer's disease directly injecting a few blood rejuvenating factors or that we need to transfuse the whole plasma from young individuals? Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, I, I think to, to really translate the, the findings, the, these initial uh, findings also from, from the transfusion studies and the plasmapheresis, I think it, to apply them to large numbers of patients, we have to figure out what the key components are. And um, maybe we need multiple factors. I, I think we do. Maybe we have to inhibit the key detrimental factors. Um, and and have a, co a, a cocktail, basically a combination uh, that that sort of mimics most of these effects. And people are trying to do that. We're trying to identify individual factors, and many other labs have described beneficial factors or detrimental factors. I think the key will be to find the most important ones and then start testing them uh, in the clinic. Of course, one big challenge is combination therapies, especially if you start. Um, with new proteins or new antibodies that have never been tested, if you now need to combine them, I think that would be very challenging and we may need new guidance from the FDA how to do that. Thank you. Can I, can I add a, a follow on question to that? Um, so in one of your earlier slides, you, you showed the plasma proteomics across the lifespan and these striking peaks in the mid 30s and especially the early 80s when many, many plasma proteins uh, appear to change in, in concentration. Um, but, but these are um, cross-sectional data, as I understand. Um, so um, focusing on the peak in the 80s, for example, might some of these proteins in fact represent sort of um, survival factors rather than aging factors? So factors that have been present potentially for a long time, but have helped this older cohorts survive into old age. Um, and of course, then the broader point of that is that some of the plasma factors present in older, in older age may, may be beneficial and promoting, pr sort of promoting survival in an aging milieu. And do we know anything about those? And for example, whether removing them, such as by plas plasmapheresis, may therefore be detrimental? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And this is one of the most vexing problems of aging research, as you know. Uh, especially if you start to study really old organisms, really old patients uh, or centenarians, um, you know, which proteins are, are um, you know, beneficial and, and allow them to live that long and which ones are detrimental and they, they lead to the eventual, you know, demise uh, of, of the system and, and death. Um, it's, you know, it's a very difficult question and you have to, you can use approaches where you, uh, look at uh, specific pathways, biological pathways, and manipulate those in, in experimental systems, or you test individual factors and, and test these very hypotheses that you mentioned. But you're absolutely right. At, at any point, we don't really know which factors are beneficial and which ones are detrimental by just looking um, at the composition of plasma. This is totally observational at this point. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, another question uh, from the audience for Dr. Zlokovich. Um, so uh, Alzheimer's disease is a regional or network disorder um, that elite, uh, sort of elite, at least initially, and in the majority of the cases uh, involves specific brain regions and connectomes, you know, particularly the medial temporal lobes 
um, the precuneus, medial prefrontal cortex, and so forth. Uh, what regional variations in the properties of the blood-brain barrier are relevant to the anatomical specificity of Alzheimer's disease? So does the blood-brain barrier differ across the brain in different regions that makes different regions susceptible to different types of pathology? Well, thank you. This is this is a great question, and I'll try to address the first one based on the relationship between the connectome and the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we do have some data that are unpublished using a hippocampus as a seeding region uh, to actually for the functional MRI one thing and also the other thing for structural DTI tractography. And we did find, you know, that uh, there is a correlation with both SPDGFR beta factor and losses of connectivity in the hippocampal region. Uh, and also uh, there is a, there is work that shows that that is with fMRI, but there is also work that shows uh, that there is a correlation between, uh, I think, uh, I, I believe it was a fractional anisotropy, you know, uh, and and the blood brain barrier breakdown in the hippocampus. Now, these are unpublished data that actually indicate uh, that there are these correlations and we are validating this data on a larger sample right now. So it's very interesting. You know, it seems, seems that uh, the blood brain barrier is related, but uh, whether it precedes or or not, we still don't have longitudinal studies, so these are cross-sectional, so we can only speculate a little bit. Now, in terms of regional permeability, that was a con in included into this question. That's very, very interesting. Um, uh, I think uh, we are trying to understand this uh, from the uh, protein composition of different proteins in human hippocampus and also in the cortex. And are there the differences, you know? And because there are two school of thoughts, one is that the blood-brain barrier is uh, probably similar or unique everywhere. And I don't belong to that school of thoughts. I believe there is a, a tailored blood-brain barrier for different brain regions. And like, you know, I remember an older discussion I, I had with Paul Gringar like uh, almost 10 years ago was, you know, well, we talk about selective vulnerability of neurons. And you know, and but could we talk about selective vulnerability of blood vessels? Because in certain regions they are there. If you have, let's say, experiments in rats that are that are treated with Western diet, the hippocampus will actually give up and and, and start uh, showing blood-brain barrier breakdown. So why is that? Is that the 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 gen the, the you know uh, the genetic composition or what? Let me say. The, the proteomic uh, composition or transcriptome composition different in this region from the other regions. So that is that is uh, particularly interesting, and I do believe in differences, but uh, we don't still have a, a really uh, pure, clear data to support that. Thank you very much. That's a really helpful and interesting answer. Um, uh, so a question for Dr. Wieskori um, from Agustin Ruiz um, about the increase of senescent cells. This process, he says, might reflect a disequilibrium between cell replacement and death. Do you think that replacement rate decreases over time, potentially due to low energy status? Um, uh, uh, in other words, do you think that the vascular system degeneration could be the main cause of body aging? Uh, alternatively, the increase of senescent cells might reflect the exhaustion of regenerative cell precursor niches in most tissues. Yeah, that's another very um, uh, you know, exciting question. And I think that aging field um, has lots of opinions about this. Um, we, we simply don't have enough data, but people are starting to create um, atlases or maps of how cells in the body age at the, you know, at the single cell level, at different tissues and different cell types. And these, these data start to show that um, you have different rates of aging, you have different trajectories that some cells um, seem to uh, not show uh, transcriptional changes for a long time and others um, you know start to change early on the immune system is 
clearly a major, um, I, I can't say driver, but it shows some of the earliest changes and infiltration of immune cells in different tissues. But then the vasculature is, is very high up there. If you um, look at, uh, at blood vessels, endothelial cells, it's clear that um, they show very early changes uh, with aging. And interestingly, they're not the same in all tissues. Um, you see some tissues that uh, show earlier transcriptional changes than others. These types of studies may give us insight, um, you know, where, where the first um, age-related changes occur, but also where we might be able to, uh, to intervene. I think it's too early to say that um, it's all the vasculature, but I completely agree with uh, Dr. Slakovich that um, for the brain, the vasculature seems to be one of the most sensitive uh, components. And uh, I can clearly um, imagine a situation where, um, you know, this function actually starts and precipitates in the vasculature and then goes out to astrocytes and neurons and, and, um, and that it doesn't really start in neurons, as, as neuroscientists have uh, believed, I think, for, uh, for decades. Um, so I, I'm totally uh, in, in line with that, uh, with that thought. Thanks, thank you. Um, so there's a, there's a question here, which I guess um, was uh, bound to come up at the moment, and I think it's to, to both of you. And the question is, in view of the recent conditional approval of uh, anti-amyloid therapy, do you think that such approvals will impact future clinical trials testing alternative therapies, such as plasmapheresis, young blood infusions, or BBB-related therapies presented uh, in this webinar? Yeah, maybe I can I can start addressing this. Uh, I think you know uh, uh, one one of the things that we discussed and I discussing with with Biogen right now is you know uh, uh, you know uh, the problem is you 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 get very good data with amyloid. It's down and it tau is down, but uh, cognition is not still improved substantially. You know, and my personal view on this is because there is a vascular dearrangement during uh, infusions. And I believe, you know, that vascular protection will be very important to do together with amyloid reducing agents such as adekunumab. Uh, because we really don't know when we remove amyloid, there is uh, a lot of small sense from a stone. When you dissolve the stone, there is a small sense that the toxic species and we don't know how much of this is really influencing, you know, the outcome. So that you really can't see, you know, um, the outcome because you're introducing another topic. And the aria that was shown in APOE4 carriers, you know, it's actually, it's vascular damage. So I do believe that infusions, and I propose, and we will be discussing this, that the infusion of, and I throw it at, a, at, a, at the end of my talk, of uh, an activated protein C mutant that stabilizes, that is vascular protective, neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory, to stabilize the vascular challenge during infusions would be very, very helpful. That is my personal view. We don't have a data, but I believe that would, uh, that offering some kind of protection to the brain is important because we really don't know if we just have a amyloid pet as one of the uh, you know, imaging in the brain. We don't know what happens with vasculature. We don't know what happens with the blood-brain barrier. Is it open? Is it not open? Is it, are we making it worse? So it's a complex question. So I, I, I believe that the combination therapy would be would be really extremely successful. But again, congratulations to Biogen and 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 them for actually pushing this. Dr. Wieskari, do you have comments? Yeah, I mean, as a basic scientist, I can't really comment on the implications for testing additional drugs or the, the clinical aspects of this. Do we have to compare now new treatments to uh, aducanumab or, or not? But to me, um, I, I have always, you know, questioned the, the concept of the amyloid hypothesis from the point that it's the trigger of um, the dysfunction that we see in the brain that we just uh, just discussed, you know, the vascular dysfunction. I think 
Uh, if you look at aging across many different species, a beta has no role in it. Um, and you don't need a beta to age. So all the systems that we're studying, whether it's the vasculature or the immune system dysfunction, all of these are taking place. And so I think a beta is a readout of injury and damage. Um, and if you remove it, it's certainly not detrimental, but I don't think it gets at the trigger of aging and the drivers of vascular dysfunction um, uh, immune dysfunction, microglial dysfunction, um, and neuronal insufficiency in, in signaling. I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's one way to sort of alleviate maybe some of the damage that is taking place, but it's not going to have a major impact, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yes, yeah. I, I align with uh, your comments because that is a really that is a, a important question now because aduca appeared in as a new scenario and uh, some investigators think that we are finished all our research in this area and really i uh, i am i am believe that it's increasing the research in this area because uh, offer the possibility to match and to combine the other's approach in one. If like, uh, uh, it's like Dr. Slokovic said, when we destroy beta, it appears that some toxins, uh, elements and components that it damage more the brain. And, uh, and beta is not the only related protein and related target for aging. We can or we must increase our research in, in order to incre increase the knowledge about neuroinflammation, neuroimmunity, the blood barrier, in order that maybe, maybe at the end of this battle, eh, this battle against Alzheimer's disease, uh, our experience could be linked to the cardiovascular diseases, that it's not only one drug, we need to reflect a lot of elements, a lot of et different etiology to concrete and to manage the, the, the disease. You are mentioned the role, the important role of the microvascular elements, the vascular uh, uh, system. We cannot avoid this one because we lose a lot of, a lot of the elements to be linked with the cause of Alzheimer's disease, like it's only one director line, one only one vision, and brain, as you are mentioned, both, it's a complex organ with a complex function, and really, it's our soul, because when we love, we don't love with here, we love with the amygdala, when we are moving, we are with, with the muscular skeleton, but we are moving from here. And that, for me, is the best moment in the, in the world of Alzheimer's disease to enrich and to provoke and to go forward in our research. It's not finished the research. It's pushing our research. I am an optimistic person. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. How nice. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I have a question for, again, both of our speakers from Amanda Cano, who asks, um, uh, who says, first of all, many thanks for these very interesting presentations. Um, a question for you both. Do you think that the increase of the leakage of the BBB is something we should try to prevent as a treatment for dementia or something we should take advantage of as an opportunity to have direct access to the brain? Yeah. Uh, maybe I can just start uh, uh, maybe citing some of our recent studies that were just published in Nature Aging, in which we have Alzheimer's mice, EPP mice, crossed with E4 mice and E3 mice. And we are acting on a blood-brain barrier exclusively on a pericyte to suppress inflammatory pathways, cyclophilin A and um, MMP9. And we are able to suppress it to the level that E4 mice with APP starts behaving like E3 mice with APP. We can't go beyond that, but we are able to basically stop the neurodegenerative process. So that's one example. 
the other example is, for instance, uh, the gene therapy, you know, with LRP1 targeting the blood brain barrier and the blood brain barrier ceiling is resulting into uh, into uh, definitely into uh, improvement of neuronal dysfunction and also into stopping or slowing down neurodegeneration. And so I always had an interesting question because this human monogenic disorders that you have a defects exactly in a blood brain barrier like GLUT1 and it has a microcephaly, has neuronal loss and a lot of problems. And now in Alzheimer's, for example, there are older studies that have shown that this transporter was reduced by 50%. It's like a haploinsufficiency. So my question is, well, we know it's a detrimental for pediatric neurologic disorder because it does bad things to the blood brain barrier and is followed by neurodegeneration. Then we have similar situation. This is just one example of the, of the genes uh, that is turned down and the protein is down. And we think, do we think it it's just a benign thing, you know, or it just has no role, you know. I mean, I, I just, it's simply, I mean, you can be fourth grader, you know, and just put the student and I'm in a quiz and they will say, yeah, of course. Why why not in one disease, why in another disease? But you see our field, as, uh, as Tony mentioned, is dominated by amyloid and tau. And, you know, but this is probably just uh, something that is, you know, burden of the disease and reflecting, you know, how brain dies, you know, you know, like when you have atherosclerotic things in the vessel, that's how the vessel dies, this, but it's not something that initiates. So I definitely think that I'm very think positively if we are able to uh, suppress uh, the, the leakages and uh, keep the vascular system healthy and blood brain barrier intact or reverse, there will be a possibility to reverse cognitive dysfunction. Of course, depend how much we are exploiting brain plasticity because the brain plasticity is not forever but i think over a period of time the brain has an amazing ability to regenerate how we still don't know but we know that happens and so as long as we don't go over that interval that is irreversible i think there is a great opportunity especially the initial stages thank you uh, dr wiskori yeah i i i think Betsa made a really good point um, that it, it's not just one um, transport that is, is changed and at the blood brain barrier with age, but it's really a dramatic um, shift as, as we found with very unbiased studies from this specific transport that is very active in, in the young vasculature where you get a lot of proteins into the brain. We're still trying to figure out how, how many and what they are. Um, but then with age, that shifts to a non-specific uptake of proteins such as albumin, fibrinogen, um, even antibodies that are not supposed to be in the brain. But it's not just one, it's, it's a massive shift in, in uptake. And we actually see um, overall fewer proteins, um, specific proteins entering the age brain. So I think you need to find an approach where you target the, the root cause of, of these changes. And, you know, we call this aging. We don't know exactly what it is, but I doubt that it's just going to be one transporter. Another transporter that, you know, is now used to deliver drugs into the brain is the transferrin receptor, but that too decreases by 30 or 40 percent in expression level as you get older. So there too, as Betsa said, there's diseases where that transport doesn't work you get, um, you get uh, degenerative disease of the brain. And, and with aging, we know now that this transport of transferrin into the brain decreases. So I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very complex system and uh, we have to try to understand what are the causes that lead to the overall dysfunction of this system and not just target one uh, at a time. So um, both those answers were very directed towards prevention of uh, disease. Um, in terms of potential treatments, um, such as plasmapheresis or potentially other ways of um, 
introducing young factors into the brain. Um, so one of the one of the things I've been doing over the last couple of years uh, is been using transcranial ultrasound. In fact, for uh, neuromodulation, but transcranial ultrasound can also be used in combination with microbubbles to open the blood-brain barrier um, uh, rather sort of. Uh, in an anatomically specific way and I wondered whether um, either of you have opinions about that sort of um, non-specific opening uh, or, uh, and allowing in or out of, of uh, molecules into the brain could be used in combination for example with plasmapheresis um, uh, or whether it would on balance be a, a dangerous thing um, mm -hmm. given that it can be done transiently. So yeah it's a it's a very complex question, you know, and probably you better know than than us, you know, probably what are the possibilities and outcomes, you know. There was a theory, you know, that, that I read that, you know, ultrasound is activating microglia and microglia are kind of trying to get better shape and do their better things. Uh, I depends also on the people's, I would say, on the status of the, or the state of their vascular system, how their vascular system is damaged, and you know what you're going to do with the, with, the, with the ultrasound. I also know that in some labs, in our labs, we use repetitive ultrasound with different sequences to make a damage to hippocampus, uh, you know, but we are doing that deliberately to open the blood-brain barrier and allow, uh, you know, things to come in. So. Uh, so maybe I'm biased from that perspective because we have not been using it to, to in the in the other way around. But in terms of a broken blood-brain barrier in the disease, you know, I think it's a very big distinction between therapeutic opening of the blood-brain barrier that is transient, that allows probably good things to come in, and pathological opening. Because very often people say, oh, the blood-brain barrier open, we can deliver. But you know, the problem is, in the area when the blood-brain barrier becomes open, if you stay for a longer time, this part of the brain gets probably excluded from 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 the from the communication with the other parts, and there is no good flow on the interstitial fluid because there is accumulation of all these proteins and everything else. So basically, this part gets blocked, and it is called opening or breakdown, but it's pathological. It's very different when you open it. Uh, therapeutically, if you want to really open and deliver. So that's uh, just a few thoughts I can offer. Thank you. Talk to me, score anything? Yeah, it's it's really not uh, outside my area. I mean, I've seen the the, the studies, and and um, it it seems you know you get interesting results in in model systems in mice, um, and I could also imagine that. Um, what you do is sort of trigger to some extent a repair response, but um, I, I don't think it will, you know, lead to a specific reconstitution of the of the normal state. But maybe by triggering an injury response that um, promotes a repair of some sort that that is then turns out to be beneficial. But I think you you probably know much more about this than we do. I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm going to move on to another question from the audience. Uh, so uh, from uh, Dr. Luis. So for Dr. Luis Corey, there are some emerging papers indicating that uh, aging features are related. Some aging features are related to microbiome host interaction. What's your opinion on this potential connection? Yeah, the, the microbiome clearly has a, um, an amazing effect uh, in model systems. I mean, if you have mice in different facilities, they may develop, have different susceptibility to diseases. I mean, it's it's really remarkable. And there's now clear evidence that um, disruption of um, the blood or the gut uh, barrier um, can lead to uh, exposure to, to uh, bacteria that then trigger responses and, and promote inflammation in the brain from Kati Andreessen, for example, here at Stanford. But then also uh, Marco Prince has shown that um, lipids from the, uh, from the gut can make it into the brain, into microglia and, and regulate their activity. So I think there is clearly precedent for uh, communication between the gut and and the brain uh, and it probably goes in both directions 
So I think we, we need to understand this more and it may uh, provide opportunities for, um, uh, for, for interventions. And it may relate to some extent also what we see um, with this accumulation of detrimental factors with aging, that some of them maybe are derived from, uh, from the gut, from a degeneration of, of the gut mucosa and um, an inflammation that, that takes hold there and then uh, produces inflammatory factor that uh, end up being detrimental for the brain vasculature, for example. I think these are fascinating questions that uh, we can start to answer now. Great, thank you. A uh, question for uh, Dr. Slokovic from uh, Carla Abdel Noor. Um, are there studies that investigates blood brain barrier dysfunction uh, influence in patients with young onset Alzheimer's disease? And potentially, I guess we could add to that uh, patients with, um, uh, with familial Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there, are, there are some studies uh, actually that have shown that uh, patients with presenilin mutations, uh, some of the presenilin mutations, because they're also different, uh, they have um, uh, vascular toxic effects. Let's say presenilin 1 mutations, if you introduce this mutation in mouse in neurons, you will have a vascular problems and damage of the blood brain barrier. The mechanism has not been really explored uh, completely. But also uh, in patients, uh, I, I did, I, we did so, we have uh, one of our faculty is working on this and we show a lot of bleedings by T2, uh, T2 star, you know, uh, MRI in these patients. Uh, we did study on biomarkers, but very small study that indicates that uh, there is, uh, of course, in these patients, there is quite reduction of A beta 42 and tau at the symptomatic stage when they are compared uh, with patients in pre-symptomatic stage that are carriers for mutations for PSN1 mutations, and when compared with the family members who are non-carriers, right? Uh, but it's interesting also that the biomarker that I was talking about, SPDGFR beta, uh, we just published some abstract, didn't publish the entire paper were also increased, uh, but they're increasing in, in parallel in this model with uh, with uh, with A beta decreases. So we were not able, we didn't have longitudinal studies, so we we're not able from cross-sectional study to say whether the vascular problem is coming before we see enough of A beta accumulation. So, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but you know, A beta is definitely vascular toxic, it tau is vascular toxic. So we have a two stages and these models of human, I call it human disease model, right? That exists, the PSN1 mutants are really a good model of showing uh, uh, toxicity, vascular toxicity, but it could be primary because of PS1 mutation expressed in neurons being toxic, uh, could be also secondary because of A beta is causing uh, cerebral uh, amyloid angiopathy or, or is, is actually leading local bleeds. So it's it's unclear completely which of these two phases are involved. Most likely both, but there is no evidence, strong evidence at this point that I know of. Can I, can I make a comment? Yeah, please do. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think that the genetic um, connection between vascular function and Alzheimer's disease is really interesting. And we recently did um, a, a in-depth um, single cell RNA sequencing of the human vasculature and there's a paper and bioarchive now and when we look at a lot of the genes um, from the Chiba studies that have pointed towards microglia because people had data from microglia and showed these genes are expressed in microglia we find many of them are expressed in vascular cells in endothelial cells pericytes these, um, you know, fibroblasts that are in the perivascular uh, space, um, as well as perivascular macrophages. And so um, I think uh, maybe we focused a bit too much now on the genetic connection uh, of these GWAS hits to microglia, uh, but many of them may actually have effects, genetic effects on the vasculature. And, and I think that will be very important to explore. 
So it's a, you know, many of these genes, even presonilins and APP, we know they're expressed in many different cell types and they may cause gain or loss of function in these cell types directly and not primarily in neurons. So I think we have to be uh, very open-minded and explore these possibilities. If, if I may add, I agree 100% with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so another a question for uh, Dr. Slokovic. Um, it's from a, a, an anonymous uh, member of the audience. It seems that there are some uh, there's some evidence suggesting that peripheral circulating immune cells might enter into the CNS. Is there any specific function of blood brain barrier controlling immune cell migrations into the brain? Yeah, well, that's actually the great questions. We did show in our earlier work, you know, that um, monocytes, you know, that are laden with amyloid beta from periphery can cross the blood brain barrier using an in vitro model by using rage system, rage receptor, and they just need rage and PICOM, the other one that is in, in between uh, um, endothelial cells. So, so they can find their way. This is at least for, uh, for peripheral monocytes that when they get eventually into the tissue become like a macrophages. But the issue is, is, a, is a more complicated right now because there is uh, this discovery of the brain, what they call it, brain-owned system that can produce, uh, you know, brain-owned neutrophils and brain-owned monocytes. So what is the interplay between these two systems? You know, it's still, to me, open to question. And I do believe, you know, there is a lot of work that was published from before showing irradiating peripheral bone marrow showing that there is a dropout of the microglia and monocytes in the brain, like Joel Coro's work and others. Now we also show when you irradiate skull, also that you eliminate this function, you know, just a recent uh, Yoni Kipnis paper in science and showing that there is, that's, uh, that's the, 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 the additional source. I think to me, looking into the bone marrow, which is basically the, the source of all of these changes, uh, it actually gives me an impression that is very different and it's very different regionally. And that could have an implication for our understanding of immune responses in brain, but also on immune responses in cancer and hematology. Because if we accept the theory that we have bone marrow is different in iliac bone, is different in a, in a, in a let's say, sternum, and is different in the occipital bone, so what all these differences tells us? Do these interact with each other? What is, what is the problem? Definitely. But going to your questions about the blood-brain barrier transport, I think definitely the blood-brain barrier let monocytes go. There is Italian group that published that neutrophils go there. Of course, you can't really see neutrophils for a long time because they die in the brain. That's not their, that's not their favorite organ to live. And also, you know, T cells are coming. T cells are coming in, in into the brain, you know. And so, so I, I, I guess you know that, that this uh, this privilege uh, theory that we had is actually very conditional right now. We should be very careful how we how we actually define immune privilege of the brain. So I guess there is a gate of entrance, but the role in the disease is is not still that much understood for for the Alzheimer's patient. Thank you. I have a, a question from Immaculada Ibanez. Um, he says, amazing talks. Thank you both. What do you think about uh, exosomes uh, as new blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease? Perhaps Dr. Biscori first. Yeah, I think there's an interesting um, field developing with, with exosome biology and it seems to me sort of looking from the outside that the techniques are getting uh, better and better to, to really generate exciting reproducible results. It's, it's remarkable how many proteins we see um, in, in plasma, for example, that are brain derived and many of them probably arrive through exosomes or some unknown mechanisms uh, into the blood and um, it's possible that we we can trace these individual proteins or we look at exosomes and enrich for exosomes first so i think it's possible that we 
uh, could arrive at uh, biomarkers that um, are derived from exosomes. Thank you. Dr. Zlokovic. Well, I, I, I agree with that, what Tony said. Uh, I just would like to add uh, one more one more thinking that by start doing some of the proteomic studies, we see how the biology was really based on economy also, so that many cell types produce same proteins, you know, and I think, for instance, we're seeing that some of the vascular cells have proteins that are typically found in neurons, like syngapin or something like that. And it's a really question, uh, then when you talk about exosomes, you know, I mean, the point is how clear they are in terms of cell specificity. And I think if we are clear on that, that's also fine. Now you have a processes that one cell eats another cell. Let's say astrocytes uh, can eat synapses, microglia can eat synapses. So when it's released something, you know, that may complicate the thing because we don't know going back when we want to film the back, what what it is in, in that one that is that is released in blood. So I, I, I think I'm, I think this is a great area of research and a great area for us to learn uh, in the future what's going on. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a question for Dr. Wieskori from um, someone in the audience. Uh, blood vesicles um, are taken into brain cells and com um, I'm sorry, into brain cells and compartments looks as a very general physiological process. So uh, it looks like a very general physiological process that vesicles are taken into brain cells. Do you think this can be interpreted as a general metabolic sensing of how the body is functioning, or might it simply reflect a way uh, to feed the key organ, the brain? What's the physiological significance of this interesting finding? Yeah, so I think what the, what the um question refers to is this uptake of, of proteins into endothelial cells and then into the brain uh, parenchyma. And, and these two different types of, of mechanisms that people often distinguish as a specific receptor mediated that uses clathrin coded vesicles and then the less uh, specific sort of based on adsorption that uses caviolin. Um, it's, it's of course also possible that you have exosomes in the extracellular space in the in the blood that fuse with the membrane and are taken up this way but i think most of what we have studied um, is really these vesicles that butt off from the membrane inside the cell and then carry um, proteins or material from from outside from the blood into endothelial cells and beyond um, but uh, yes, they are absolutely essential for normal physiology. And when we make that statement, we say this is what we see in a young, normal functioning organism. And with age, that composition changes that the different processes that govern that, um, that vesicular transport change. And so we, we, we call this pathological, but I think absolutely these are essential processes. Otherwise, nature would probably not have employed them. Thank you. Um, and I that, that's that's really helpful. I think there's just um, one more question here from Inmaculada Ibanez, which I think would probably be a, a good one to uh, to finish up with to both of you, potentially to all of us, but um, certainly to both of you. Uh, do you think that you would, um, uh, do you think it's a good idea if you were able to, to store up your own blood whilst you're still young uh, and use it for yourself when you're older? Would you do that if you had the opportunity? <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess that's to some extent addressed to, to uh, our research. I, I don't think that's necessary at all because the composition of the plasma is not that unique. I mean, there's some unique aspects that we're actually exploring between individuals, but by and large, most of the composition of the blood is very similar between individuals. And so it changes from young to old for everybody. So you don't, you, and for that reason, you don't necessarily need your own plasma to uh, rejuvenate or restore the, the young state. You could just get it from a young person, of course, if they volunteer it to you. 
Um, and also, it doesn't have to be matched by a uh, blood cell type because it's only the liquid fraction that do, does not contain uh, these stimulating cell surface antigens that you have on red blood cells. So that, that, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, any, any comments to, to add to that, Dr. Zlokovic? Well, I think I, I agree with what Tony said and he is really expert in, in this area. I just would like to add one thing, you know, to maybe uh, get the spin again on the vasculature that I think, you know, when we start working on some of these issues, even 20 years ago, that the idea behind it was that genetic code that was given to the vascular system when we are born is not as generous as, as it is for other cell types. And so, so basically there is vulnerability. How many times the cell can do population doubling before they go into the senescent stage? When they go into the senescent stage, they, they develop inflammatory, you know, you know kind of uh, phenotype. And then, then they don't have this function. We see all of these changes in the transporters, in the receptors and everything. So if we can make uh, the good young plasma to actually somehow improve the genetic code of this crucial, uh, um, you know, expression of the crucial, uh, you know, transporters, protein receptors of the blood brain body, it's a very complex. There are 10,000 transcripts, 5,000 proteins then I think we can start fighting aging of the vascular system. And I think that's that's probably going to be fundamental. My feeling is if we do that, we would actually allow neurons to be happy for 150 years. That was my theory long time ago, and I didn't change my mind, I think. <laughs> so. It's good. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much indeed um, to you both for a uh, fantastic discussion and presentations. Clearly generated a huge number of questions um, and interest from the whole of the audience. Uh, we're really grateful. This is a uh, an area of science which is clearly going to be incredibly important in, in the future. Um, and I'll hand over to Dr. Boala for the final word. Well, that is time to say goodbye. I don't know if you want to to continue with the, the questions, you are, you are feel free, but I think that it's time to say goodbye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Butler, for sharing this session and sparking a debate because it was a very important debate. And uh, let me again thanks to the our wise, wonderful speakers wise, wonderful speaker for their fascinating talks and which encourage us to learn more and more about this very specific and very complex topic. It's not easy. And of course, I want to thank our partners, Griffles, and our collaborators, Ken Farna and Universidad Internacional de Barcelona, and you all, the audience, for this lively discussion. Well, we have reached the end of the first edition of AFE Global Research Summit. But, but, all this is a but. But stay tuned. Stay tuned because we are preparing the second edition. We are preparing the second edition that will take place in the 2022 with the same aim, the connecting researchers, the connecting academia, and to keep up with the late advance in research. Now, I have to say goodbye. I wish all you a happy summer, COVID free, free of COVID, but it's important, and look forward to seeing you in the next edition. That is all, folks. See you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Hello. I am Merce Boada, the founder and chief medical officer of AFE. Alzheimer Center Barcelona. As a host, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce you to the first Global Research Summit. 
Since 1995, we've always had a clear purpose to bring Alzheimer diagnosis, treatment, research to a whole new level. Today, we are a renowned organization all over the world with a team of 100 professionals. Let me show you how we have got here. Since 1996, we have diagnosed around 30,000 people. We have collected 17,000 biological samples and lead 138 clinical trials. Just now, as I am talking, we are doing 22 clinical trials targeting all phases of the Alzheimer disease and nine national and international research projects along with the highest level companies in the world. This allowed us to be heavily involved in the key scientific events of the last two decades. In fact, in 2020, even with the challenge of the pandemic, we have published more papers than ever before. Quite a journey, isn't it? But now it's time to set our sights on what's ahead with some passion and propose from back in 1996. It's time to introduce you to the future of research. Welcome. Welcome to the Global Research Summit.